When strolling through the Criterion Collection, one can be sure to find the works of many filmmaking auteurs like Hitchcock, Godard, Kurosawa, Fellini, Bergman, Truffaut, and Bay. That's right, tell your friendly neighborhood cinema snob that Michael Bay has two films in the Criterion Collection, and then watch their frickin' heads explode like a, well, li like a Michael Bay movie. One thing for sure is Michael Bay sure knows how to blow stuff up really, really good. The story can often at times seem secondary, as long as they get the perfect shot, which often features some of that sweet, sweet product placement and some of that sweet, sweet red, white, and blue. With his epic, fast-paced use of movement and scale, Michael Bay has become a genre unto himself, affectionately dubbed Bayhem. But with the Transformers franchise in his rear view and an underperforming recent few years, it's time we figure out just what the fuck happened to Michael Bay. Man, I don't know what I do, but I just know how to do what I'm doing, but I don't know what the F I'm doing, but I know what I'm doing. But to truly understand what the fuck happened to Michael Bay, we must begin at the beginning of the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1965, Los Angeles. Michael Bay grew up with a healthy appreciation for film. He would pursue that passion and at the age of 15 ended up working as an intern for George Lucas on Raiders of the Lost Ark. Michael Bay says that when he saw the final film in theaters, it was so good that he knew in that moment that he wanted to be a director, like Steven Spielberg, the director of Raiders of the Lost Ark. He would attend university and then would get started in the world of commercials and music videos. After directing a video for the film Days of Thunder, Producers Jerry Brockheimer and Don Simpson kept him in mind to direct a new buddy cop film that was originally meant to star Dana Carvey and John Lovitz, titled Bulletproof Hearts. Eventually, the film would cast new leads who were more familiar to audiences of the small screen and undergo a title change, Bad Boys, starring Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. Now back up. Put the gun down and give me a pack of tropical fruit bubblicious. It was Michael Bay's fly by the seat of your pants shooting style that yielded the film's biggest moments, as the now iconic 360 dolly hero shot was just something Michael Bay thought up on the way to set one morning. He must have really liked it though, as he has repeated that exact same shot in nearly every one of his movies ever since. But the production of Bad Boys was a tough one. All of these bad boys needed to prove that they could play with the big boys, so they often squeezed four shooting days into one. Michael Bay even funded the entire explosive ending himself as the studio, Sony, refused to give the budget any more because they already gave Michael 19 million. But it all paid off in the long run as the film would go on to gross over $141 million worldwide. And it really showed off Michael Bay's eye for visuals. But it would also be Michael Bay's introduction to those pesky film critics who said that the film was too loud, with more explosions than story. Kaboom. With the financial success of Bad Boys, Jerry Brockheimer and Don Simpson hired Michael Bay to direct their next film, a high-octane movie about a man who takes Alcatraz hostage, called The Rock. This epic masterpiece had a bit of a troubled production, with studio executives not liking the mounting budget, so they considered firing Michael Bay. But Sean Connery stepped in and saved the day, saved the Bay, and said that Michael Bay was doing a wonderful job and to give them more money. 
And thank God Sean Connery did stand up for Michael Bay because The Rock is like the best action movie made at that time. One of the best action movies ever made. In my most humble of opinions, and my opinions are always humble, it features an iconic performance from Nicolas Cage and, of course, Sir Sean Connery, with many people saying that his character is clearly an older James Bond. It's a film theory. This film, The Rock, would actually garner Michael Bay some solid reviews from those pesky critics, who called it a first-rate slam-dunk bang-bang action thriller with lots of style. And it would be Michael Bay's second blockbuster in a row as The Rock garnered over 335 million buckaroos worldwide, and even was nominated for an Oscar for Best Sound. Oh yeah, and got on that Criterion collection. Grosses would stay high, even if the critical reception wouldn't, with Michael Bay's next movie, Armageddon, in 1998. The same year as Deep Impact. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Armageddon would garner horrible reviews, with the consensus being that it looked great but lacked any intelligence or substance. But that doesn't matter to audiences, uh, people like me, because, uh... I went to go see it a few times, helping this movie take in a massive $553.7 million worldwide. I don't know, say what you want about Armageddon, it's a fun, wild ride. It's the edge of your seat the whole time, and it's just, you know, it's just pure Michael Bay. I, 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 I love it. It's fun, and sometimes movies are allowed to be fun, even movies about the end of the world. Armageddon would actually receive four Academy Award nominations, including Best Original Song, Best Sound, and Best Sound Effects and Visual Effects, while also winning Michael Bay the Best Director Award at the Saturn Awards. And of course, it would be nominated for seven Razzie Awards, including Worst Director and Worst Picture. But it would also make its way into the Criterion Collection. Mr. Mikey Poo would continue his string of box office successes with Pearl Harbor. That seemed to be the tale of two movies. Most people thought the depiction of the actual attack was done quite masterfully, but the rest of the movie, you know, with like the acting and the romance and the characters and the, you know, that stuff, it kind of seemed like an overlong wannabe Titanic in like the worst way possible. Pearl Harbor would win an Academy Award for Best Sound Editing, while also being nominated for some Razzies, like Worst Picture. And say what you want about this horrible mess of a movie, Michael Bay says that quite a few Pearl Harbor survivors, veterans, heroes, have told him that they love his film. So, there. In 2003, Michael Bay would take on his first sequel, Bad Boys 2, that some critics hailed as the worst film of 2003, while others were able to appreciate it as simple, mindless movie fun. Of course, audiences and their hard-earned cash are all that really matter in this movie-making industry. And Bad Boys 2 was yet another financial hit for this master of disaster, as it took in over $273 million worldwide. And then Hot Fuzz came out and everybody truly appreciated it for the masterpiece that it really is. In 2005, Michael Bay would venture out from his very lucrative collaborations with Jerry Brockheimer and start a very lucrative relationship with Mr. Steven Spielberg. 
the guy who made Raiders of the Lost Ark and kind of inspired Mr. Bay to be a movie maker. But sadly, for this first collaboration, The Island was not a financially successful film. It was Michael Bay's first true misfire, as it was only able to grab $162.9 million off a $126 million budget, along with a lot of behind-the-scenes lawsuits and copyright stuff, and oh my oh my, it was a mess. Michael Bay and Steven Spielberg were about to embark on a new film that would launch a multi b -b 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 billion dollar franchise. The film was Transformers. In 2005, Steven Spielberg, who was executive producing the film, personally asked Michael Bay to direct this Transformers movie. But Michael Bay scoffed at the idea, calling it a stupid toy movie and had them amp up the military presence. Something that Michael Bay likes to do in all of his movies. Because it works. Michael Bay would even take a reduced salary to work on this film, Transformers, to keep the budget down. Which is listed at around $150 million. While some say it's around $200 million, but who knows? Who knows the truth in the land of Hollywood land? Especially when it comes to money. Michael Bay would keep cutting costs by filming entirely in the United States, and even reusing footage from his other films, with some CGI added, like this shot from the island. It would pay off, financially at least, as the first Transformers movie, Transformers 1, would gross nearly $710 million worldwide while the film was also very, very close to being certified fresh, if you believe in tomatoes. But yeah, was heavily criticized by some critics who found the characters to be lacking, while the action and the effects were top-notch. Transformers even won the MTV Movie Award for Best Movie. Bumblebee, stop lubricating the man. Guess that thing to stop, huh? Michael Bay must have enjoyed making these Transformer movies because the next two films on his filmography were Transformer movies. First up would be 2009's Transformers Revenge of the Fallen that, although many people questioned the quality of the script, this one had it really hard as when it went into production with just a treatment that was handed in just minutes before the 2007 writer's strike, which meant that in early stages of filming Revenge of the Fallen, no Writers Guild of America member could work on the script until a new deal was reached. Of course, none of that really mattered when the film was released in 2009 and ultimately went on to make over $836 million worldwide, proving that it was critic-proof, as it was Michael Bay's worst reviewed movie at the time. Revenge of the Fallen would go on to win three Razzie Awards, including Worst Picture and Worst Director, while also netting Bay an Alliance of Women Film Journalist Award nomination, as he was nominated for the Sexist Pig Award. <laughs> what? In 2011, Michael Bay would return for the final Shia LaBeouf-fronted Transformers film, with Transformers Dark of the Moon. This Transformers movie would continue to be hated by the critics, as again, they said that the visuals were impressive, but not enough to forgive the thin script. But audiences once again said, F*** the script, we don't f*** 
f***ing care, we just wanna watch robots bang into each other and go boom, boom, diggity, biggity, boom, boom. Cause this one would earn 1.1 bu 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 billion with a B dollars worldwide. With Michael Bay again being nominated for worst director at the Razzies. But he could not hear them because his ears were full of money and explosions. Bay needed a break from those giant robots, so we went on to work with some giant men and make a smaller, more personal film, as small as a Michael Bay film can be, that is based on a wildly unbelievable true story. Michael Bay would work with Marky Mark and Dwayne The Rock Johnson on the R-rated Pain and Gain. That's right, the director of The Rock made a movie with The Rock. This time, critics would actually praise the script, but then go on to say that Michael Bay wasn't the right director for this story, with some getting upset saying that he glorified real-life murderers. To get this movie, Pain and Gain, made, Michael Bay and the lead actors would work for scale, like the lowest they could legally work for, in order to keep the budget of this film down. Pain and Gain did go on to make 86.2 million worldwide off a 26 million dollar budget and was funded by Paramount as a way to seduce Michael Bay to come back to the Transformers franchise, which he did the following year, reuniting with Marky Mark for Transformers Age of Extinction. The film was again trashed by those pesky critics who only seem to like good movies, but by now it should be obvious that if a movie says a Michael Bay film, it's going to be slammed by those critics. So when it comes to a Michael Bay movie, all that really matters is what the audience thinks, and uh, well, this time the audience, they dug it. I wasn't in the audience for that one, though, so I, I don't know, but a lot of people liked this one. They liked it enough to give it 1.1 billion dollars worldwide, while also becoming the highest grossing film ever in China at the time. And this time, Bay would take home the Razzie for Worst Director. Worst Director. This one's for you, a-holes! In between Transformer films, Bay would take on another true story. This time, it was the film 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. Despite still not garnering Bay actual praise from critics, many would admit that this is his most mature film yet, and it showed that he has grown as a filmmaker. But it still suffered from an over-reliance on explosions, but uh, like there really were explosions because this is a real story, and, and Michael Bay was really dedicated to accuracy designing the set to look exactly like the real place. Despite being a really solid film about a knight that has lived in infamy, it would be one of the few Michael Bay movies to actually lose money, as it only managed to secure $69 million against a $50 million budget before marketing costs. But like always, it didn't seem like Michael Bay gave a as this film, 13 Hours, you can tell that it's a passion project, and that the director behind this project really cared about doing the best job possible. So yeah, who cares if it didn't make money, because Michael Bay could always go back to the guaranteed moneymaker that is a Transformers movie, and he did just that in 2017's Transformers The Last Night, which currently ranks as Michael Bay's 
worst reviewed movie with just 16% on those tomatoes that are rotten.com, if you trust tomatoes. And even more surprisingly, this film is reported to have lost Paramount over $100 million, signaling that audiences may have begun growing tired of the bayham that is the Transformers movies. So this last night would be the last Transformers movie that Michael Bay directed. Your time is over, Prime. You failed. Michael Bay is a filmmaker that demands the big screen, so it was a bit weird and surprising that his next film, Six Underground, would premiere exclusively on the streaming service Netflix. But then everything kind of made sense when we found out that Netflix threw $150 million at Michael Bay and said, do whatever the fuck you want. And that's exactly what he did. He did whatever the fuck he wanted, which resulted in the most Michael Bay movie to ever Michael Bay. The opening car chase alone is just, you know, pure Michael Bay him. And uh, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a fun one. I say if you're gonna be Michael Bay, you better be Michael Bay all the way. That's what I have to say. But what do those pesky critics have to say? Uh, well, they hated it. Yet audiences would eat it up. With over 83 million members of Netflix watching it on its first month of release. And despite those amazing viewing numbers, the critical reception saw Netflix cancel a planned sequel. Which I guess would have been called Seven Underground. But Michael Bay would return to the big screen in 2022 with the high-octane action thriller Ambulance that would actually become his best-reviewed film to date, with critics saying that this movie, Ambulance, proves that there is more room for Michael Bay-type movies in the marketplace, and that audiences would miss him if he vanished from Hollywood. And wouldn't you know it, with great reviews like that, it represents Michael Bay's lowest grossing film ever, taking in $52.3 million off a $40 million budget before marketing costs. So it seems like the more money Michael Bay's movies make, the more the critics hate them, and the less money Michael Bay movies make, the more the critics like them. He just can't frickin' win. But who really cares because the action, the camera work, the editing, the directing, the acting, the story in this film Ambulance? Well, it proved that Michael Bay still got it and he's better than ever. All right! One second! In the year 2011, GQ printed an article titled The Oral History of Michael Bay the most explosive director of all time. And through several pages of interviews with his collaborators from Will Smith to Scarlett Johansson to Steven Spielberg to his own mother, an image of a man that everyone genuinely loves and respects emerged. A man with a distinct visual style. A style that allows anyone watching to know that they're watching a Michael Bay movie within minutes something very few filmmakers have achieved. Love him or hate him, the dude is an artist with a vision and a voice. An auteur. Yes, there have been rumors that this guy is abusive and difficult to work with on set, and that he's had many arguments with many of his leading actors, and yet, at the end of the day, or, you know, after... <laughs> the fire has cooled down a bit. His co-workers are the first ones to come to his defense and say just how much they actually did love working with him. Just that he does it a bit differently than other directors they've worked with. He's tough, but it's because he demands the best. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Michael Bay for joining us. Like I said, Michael Bay is a genre unto himself, 
and for the most part, audiences show up for his films. Because if nothing else, they know they're gonna get something really, really cool to look at on a giant screen. Or on Netflix. He is a professional who knows how to compose shots to get exactly what he wants. He cares so much about every single frame that often this director is an uncredited camera operator for his films. And nine out of ten times, he is in the action alongside his actors. To some, it may seem like Michael Bay is not a good filmmaker, but it's actually quite the opposite. If you study his shots, you see a man who is in complete control of every aspect of his films, except the story. Luckily, we still have more to come as Michael Bay is currently working on several projects, including directing a pilot for an untitled Bounty Hunter series, and his name is currently attached to direct a big screen adaptation of the hit novel Robopocalypse. With these projects in the pipeline, it sounds like nobody should give a f about what the f happened to Michael Bay because he has been and will continue to be just fine, whether you like his films or not. Kaboom. It's more exciting to end things with an explosion. You know what the word for that is? Awesome? Bingo.